cops had arrived at Grandma Wright's home to find a little farmhouse of unimaginable horror. Her 18-year-old great-granddaughter was already dead. And the teenager's mother, 44-year-old Karen, had also been killed in a horrifying Thanksgiving holiday massacre. But 89-year-old grandmother Dorothy was still alive, as was Emily's younger sister, Lauren, who was 16. I don't want to die! Who did this to you? And with her dying breath, Lauren tells Deputy Sheriff Nathan Perling the identity of the man who shot the entire family. She told me, Craig. And I said, who's Craig? And she said, my dad. The deputy could hardly believe his own ears. And she was very clear. And so at that moment, I put out the, I put out the dispatch who we were looking for, uh, who had done this. And then I just held her. Until medics arrived and rushed Lauren to a hospital where the heroic teen would be declared dead soon after arrival. She was amazing. Um, I can't imagine the level of pain that she was in emotionally and physically. Grandma Wright would also identify Craig Kaler as the gunman before dying several days later. And as heartbreaking as it is, Craig and Karen's little boy Sean, just 10 years old, would point the finger at his father. He watched his dad come in the back door and shoot his mom. Before fleeing to the safety of a neighbor's home. We all believe that, yes, absolutely, the son was intentionally spared. And investigators would learn why after capturing Craig the morning after the massacre. When someone spotted the fugitive father abandoning his truck and running down a quiet road in the woods. I believe there's somebody back here. And 46-year-old Craig Keeler would surrender peacefully to a sheriff's deputy who responded to the 911 call. He pulled up to him and rolled his window down, and the individual said, I'm the, I'm the man you're looking for. This doesn't look really very good, as you, I'm sure, can well understand. And uh, I missed it. I missed it. Keeler refuses to talk to detectives at the station about the day of his family's massacre, but he speaks openly about the events leading up to it. Obviously, it's the sign connection. Admitting that he was hurt and angry when his wife Karen left him for another woman. A fellow fitness instructor, Sonny Reese, and then filed for divorce. I was having a hard time with the whole situation. Kaler says he was agreeable to Karen having a relationship with Sonny in the beginning. I said, you know, I'm just so happy. I, you know, if there's something you wanted to try, just, just don't want to lose you in the process. Just be careful. Right. Trying to be a, trying to be nice about it. So what happened? I mean, it just, it just became just a relationship that took over. Kaler says Karen's affair with Sonny continued even after he moved the family from Texas to Missouri, in the hope of breaking them up and winning back his wife. She'd fly down there, Sonny would fly up here. And Kaler says he was furious when he learned Karen was allegedly taking the kids with her when she visited Sonny. The kids told me that they stayed in a hotel room. And Sonny was there, obviously. He says he also felt humiliated when Karen and Sonny came out by flaunting their relationship at a New Year's Eve party attended by some of his friends. They were sitting together and rubbing each other's leg and I mean, just, just making a spectacle. And then it just got out of control. And Sonny had apparently enraged Keeler when she sent him this text reading in part, she's only staying with you because she believes that right now it's best for the kids. She doesn't love you, Craig. And he tells detectives Karen only rubbed salt in the wounds. She had him arrested on domestic violence charges for hugging her against her wishes while they were still married. Yeah, that's what she moved down. Andy says that arrest, along with the divorce and the toll it took on his work performance, had cost him his job with the city. And he was arrested right outside the city council meeting. It was horribly embarrassing to him. I understood that you were making quite a bit of money there, too, which is over 150000 a year. Yeah. Kaler says he lost even more money when Karen allegedly cleaned out their $50,000 joint bank account. And he was ordered to pay more than $3,000 a month in child support. So he lost his wife, his children, his job, and was living back home with his parents at that point. 
Kaler tells detectives he even lost the affection of his daughters. They sided with mom Karen after she filed for divorce. Were they angry with you? I don't know if they were angry. Were you angry at them? Well, I wasn't angry and frustrated sometimes. He was upset with them for condoning the mother's relationship that he didn't approve of. And investigators suspect that's why Kaler murdered the two teenagers, as well as their mother Karen and grandmother Dorothy, when his rage finally exploded in that massacre. It's our belief that he went there with all intention of killing uh, Karen and, her, and the two daughters. Prosecutor Brandon Jones also believes Kaler spared the life of his son Sean because he remained close to his father and at 10 was too young to understand what was going on between his parents. He shot mom deliberately and then intentionally moved on past the son and allowed the son to run out. We believe that his son was his buddy. He liked his son. And ironically, as the only survivor of the massacre, young Sean would be the star witness for the prosecution at his father's murder trial. Sean obviously identified his dad as being the one who walked in and shot his mom. For a boy to get up there, the weight of the world on his shoulders and testify. Extremely tough for him. I think he was proud that Sean was up there testifying, that he was, had the ability to do that. And Craig Kaler, who had pleaded not guilty by reason of mental illness, would be convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to death. There was never remorse, never sadness. It was almost a sense of accomplishment. Uh, he was proud of what he did. There was certainly no tears shed by Craig Kaler in court. Fully convinced in his own twisted mind, says Prosecutor Jones, that he righteously delivered his son from the clutches of his mother and her lover, Sonny Reese. He's written letters to me from death row and to other people. He feels that he did it for his son. That's, I think, how he can live with himself, is that he did this to free Sean. Which doesn't make any sense to family members left mourning the loss of four loved ones at the murderous hands of Craig Kaler. I'm not saying he's insane, but not a, a person who's got all their brain faculties wouldn't kill somebody, period. After sentencing, Craig Kaler added one final insult while walking out of court, yelling to his mother and father, quote, take care of Sean so he's not raised by a bunch of freaks. After going into the foster system, Sean would eventually live with Craig's parents. He's now graduated high school and works in Kansas. I'm Chris Hansen. If you like this story, make sure you tune in every day to Crime Watch Daily. You can find where the show airs in your city at CrimeWatchDaily.com. Watch it live or record it on your DVR and watch it at night. And to all those criminals out there, remember, we are watching.